Next, on the OHIO podcast, we respond to the headlines coming out of the first week of fall practice for the Buckeyes. We continue our two-a-day Big Ten previews with Iowa and Rutgers. Plus, we play true or false, and that all starts right now. It's so easy to be average. You know it as well as I know it. It takes a little something to be special, Don. It takes a little something special to be a great player. We don't have enough great players. To hell with that! We don't want to coach average. I don't want to be around you. Why be around average? Be proud of our young people in the classroom, in the community, and most especially in 310 days in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Three things. Number one, the team that hits the hardest and the longest, the team that starts the fastest, and the team is too damn smart to make mistakes. If you take it to them, if you don't make mistakes, and you keep taking it to them, there's no question who wins. It's time for the best Buckeye podcast by fans for the fans where they hate that team up north as much as you do. It's time for the OHIO podcast. OHIO! Welcome back to the OHIO podcast. I am your host, Buckeye Boggs, recording live from a beautiful north central Ohio. And I'm joined by my co-host, Chris Wilds, on this beautiful Sunday evening. Chris, how's it going tonight, my friend? Well, I'll tell you, like you said, Eric, it's a beautiful day. It was uh, nice and warm today. Got to spend a little bit of time outside, uh, you know, uh, loading up for that big uh, Route 30 sale that uh, we've got for the Ohio State store here uh, this coming Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So, uh, yeah, just just getting prepped up for that. And uh, at least I wasn't getting rained on when I was loading up the van. There you go. There you go. Yes, that's right. We did have a big storm yesterday. I went camping this weekend with my wife. Enjoyed that over at the Cardinal Center off I-71 uh, between here, Delaware, and Mansfield and a little town in Morrow County. And did you see the fish my wife caught, man? I did not. Was it was it a rather impressive fish, was it? Uh, Yeah, it was a uh, record for the campground. Um, she caught the biggest fish that ever came out of that pond. Uh, go to my Facebook page, check that out when you get a chance, Chris. This thing was a monster. Anyways, <clears throat> we are so excited because Ohio State camp, they, they went they went to camp, man. Summer conditioning and uh, fall camp has begun. I'm not sure exactly which they call it there, Chris, but um, we are 25 days away from today. And as when they you hear this tomorrow or this evening, tomorrow they will be 24 days away from kickoff in Minnesota, and we are going to start this show by talking about all the news that we have heard. The media got to cover two of those practices this week as far as the first part of those practices, Chris, and there were some juicy tidbits that came out of that that we've just got to talk about. So I'm going to give you the floor first. What piece of news caught your eye from this first week of practice, my friend? Well, I'll tell you, the first bit of news is a bit of a sad news. Uh, that being that Tyler Friday is uh, lost for camp and potentially a large portion of the season. Uh, you know, according to Coach Day, he said uh, Tyler Friday won't be available. I won't get into his injury just yet. I haven't talked to him about that, about making it public. But he won't be available really for camp and really for most of the season. Yeah. You know, obviously, this is one of our deepest positions on the team, thankfully. And I'm not worried about how they're going to perform. You know, you just never want to see this happen to anybody, especially a senior, to suffer an injury like this before the start of his his, uh, senior year. You know, Friday really played well at times last year. He looked really good against Clemson last year. You know, you're just uh, you're you're hoping that he was going to be able to come out, play well, add some depth and strength to that group. But unfortunately, it looks like he's gone for the year. Right. Or a good portion of it. 
Well, let's talk about that defensive end position. We we already knew that they were going to be rotating some people. They we know that Tyreek Smith showed tremendous flash in the Clemson game last year. We're hoping for that a consistency of that throughout the year. And this is senior year. We've heard all the buzz about Zach Harrison. Those are the two guys that we've had penciled in as the starters on the defensive end ever since the end of last season. Tyler mm-hmm. Friday was in that next group with Javante Jean Baptiste. They're juniors. It's time for them to to make a splash, step up, and uh, uh, and assume the mantle next year as senior leaders. But Given the fact that Tyler Friday is now out, I think this is the opportunity that people like Jack Sawyer and JT Tumulau were looking. These guys are definitely going to get in. They're going to get playing time. We knew they were going to get playing time already, Chris. I think their playing time just went up with this news about Tyler Friday. And I'll be honest, I it sounds to me like they knew Tyler Friday was not going to play this year. It was just announced that, you know, hey, he's not he's not going to be available this year. I think that they've kind of known this all along. And the fact that they that, that what Ryan Day said about Jack Sawyer and JT getting uh, you know, that they're gonna their playing time's gonna go up a little bit here. I think that can be kind of a positive thing, don't you? I do. Um, in fact, I don't know if you've heard, but here's another little tidbit uh, that I picked up on. Um, have you heard that they're practicing a new Rushman package? And it's Jack Sawyer and Harrison at the ends with Haskell Garrett at, at, at one tackle and JTT playing that three technique tackle. Ooh, that is juicy. I like that. We know we wondered if he was going to be strictly defensive end or if they were going to move him to the inside as well. There's our answer. I think they're going to play. Sounds both. like they're going to use that flexibility that he ha- he comes with and uh, put it to some good use. Yeah, I, I there, obviously, I mean, you'd be a fool not to, right? I mean, if he's one of your yeah. best and you're going to put him in that Rushman package, you you do that, you go with it, and and so obviously that's exactly what Coach Day and Larry Johnson have plans of doing. And uh, I'm excited to see that. I I don't know that I've been this excited about a pair of freshmen at Ohio State on the defensive side. I've 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 felt this way maybe on the offensive side, but I've not felt the kind of anticipation that we're getting from the the just the buzz from Buckeye Nation about two defensive linemen as freshmen like we are with these guys. We've seen it like with one guy, you know, Chase Young for one season or the Bosa's when they were in, but not from two guys like this yeah yeah it's 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 really kind of mind-blowing uh what they potentially have there at ohio state on that defensive line this year and for the next couple years yeah um so some other bits of news so i can't confirm that this is indeed the way it's going to be but it appears that mayan williams was taking snaps to start camp yes as the first string running back, he was running with the first team. I have to feel like this is them giving him the shot. You get the first shot here to be the, the starting running back. I, I, I'm kind of surprised by this. But then again, if you stop and you think about all the buzz we were hearing in the offseason about him transform, transfer, uh, transforming his body and he was putting all the work in behind the scenes. This guy came in despite his three-star rating, despite not being the number one option in that class at the running back position. If you recall, they were after uh, uh, Bijan Robinson, who ended up going to Texas, and Knightley, I can't remember his first name, who ended up going to Miami, Florida. Mm-hmm. And they were going to get both of them, if you remember. Then they got none of them. Then they had to circle back and get Mayan Williams out of Cincinnati, who at the time was committed to Iowa State. And he decommitted from Iowa State, decided to go play for the Buckeyes. And he came on campus. And ever since then, Chris, this guy has been like a bull in a china shop. He is refusing to just sit on the bench and, and become a backup. This kid is pushing everybody in that room. And the fact that I think they gave him the the first reps with the first team in the very first practice to to, to start the season here is them saying we are rewarding ev- all your efforts and everything you've done and go win the go win this position. Someone go take it from them. And yeah, and from I don't, what I'm hearing, oh god, go no. I'm just saying I don't know if anybody can at this point. Well, I'll tell you, Eric, from what I'm hearing, Mayan Williams got the first team reps that first day out of the gate. 
Um, but other guys were getting first team reps, including Teague, Crowley, um, and, and trading on Henderson as well. Uh, and these guys were taking a lot of a lot of different uh, a lot of uh, excuse me a lot of reps, uh, specifically when it came to doing the quarterback pitch on the option. All these guys were seeing a lot of reps during that. So may, maybe that tells us a little bit about what direction we're heading with the option, and maybe a little bit about where we might be going with the starting quarterback as well. There you go. Um, what else you got for me? Well, I'll tell you, Eric, uh, something else that I had heard. And, uh, you know, on the offensive line, I think it's kind of been assumed that three positions were pretty much locked up with Munford, Petit Ferrer, and Paris Johnson. You know, Harry Miller and Matthew Jones were thought to be uh, in the lead on the other two spots with uh, Whipler and Josh Fryer both really making a strong b- uh, bid for playing time. However, I heard, according to uh, former Buckeye Kirk Barton, who hosts the Scoop World Order uh, podcast, uh, he's actually re- uh, got reports in that there may be some movement along that offensive line. Yep. Mumford may possibly be moving inside to play left guard. Mm. NPF may be moving out to left tackle. Paris Johnson at right guard with Duwan Jones getting the start at right tackle. Mm. Interesting, because I've also heard that Josh Fryer is making a serious push to be left guard. Yeah. Which, I, I mean, let's just, okay, let's stop and look at this. The positives of this. You got options. When you, oh, yeah, when, they're, they're, whenever you have that many options on an offensive line, that shows a, a, a very healthy position group and, and and one that gets beat up badly throughout the season, Chris. So the fact that we have this many options where we can explore these type of things is a huge, huge positive for this team. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And again, we, we haven't even talked about the big five-star tackle coming in uh, – as a freshman this year, I mean, there's yeah. just so many options on that that offensive line that you know I don't see any way that it's not one of the if not the top line in the nation this year. Right, right. It's I agree, I agree. Chris, you're talking about Donovan Jackson, the 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 big yes. Texan, um, big Texas five star offensive lineman. Yeah, I mean, this is this is it is just a. It's an embarrassment of riches, as they say, Chris, when you, when you look at our offensive line and our running back rooms. And there's one and more thing. And quarterback room. <laughs> yeah, that, right? We're going to get there in just a minute. One more one more bit of piece of information that I want to give out to there. Kerry Combs, in an interview, was asked yes. about Court Williams, and he dropped this one on us. Court Williams is the most diligent worker I've seen at any time, anywhere any place. Chris, where did Kerry Combs coach before he came back to Ohio State? Well, I believe that would be with the Tennessee Titans, was it not? Yeah, I think that's in the National Football League last time I checked, right? Absolutely. Uh, he just said Court Williams is the most diligent worker than anybody he's ever even coached in the NFL. Wow. Okay. That's some pretty high praise. That tells me Court Williams is going to play significant playing time, dude. He might not start. He is, I think, a redshirt freshman, but he's going to play. And again, when we're looking for answers uh, in the in the defensive backfield in a position group that was, uh, dare I say, a weak link last year, the fact that we are seeing this and hearing about this is, I think, only can be a positive, man. Yeah, yeah. And, and let me take you to another positive in that defensive backfield. And it might be some depth provided by, of all people, Demario McCall. They're saying he has been really solid at the corner position. He's been he's seen some first team reps, although it's likely he won't start. But man, he could add some valuable depth back there. They said that he is playing very well in camp. Great. I again, I said it. If Demario McCall gives us anything and it's positive at this point, you just take it's it, a bonus, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm rooting for the guy. I mean, he could have went 
I mean, there were even media members out there that were suggesting he needed to leave and go to a, a Mac school and just, you know, dominate. Like he's just going to go there and just be the, but the, obviously the kid chose Ohio state. He loves Ohio state. He's got a relationship with all his teammates and uh, he wants to continue that. So, um, I mean, well, why would we discourage that? You know what I mean? I, I think we should really embrace this as fans and just become Demario McCall fans for this year and say, go get them, Tiger. You know, do what you got to do. Absolutely. All right, let's move on and talk about the quarterback room because it, it was made official. We knew this about a week and a half ago. The rumors were coming out, and it was made official this past week. Quinn Ewers is foregoing his senior year of high school. And he's coming to Ohio State this year and will be eligible to play this year. Two questions. Number one, what are your expectations for Quinn this year? And number two, how will this affect the quarterback room, Chris? Well, I'll tell you, for me, Eric, I don't. he comes in, I think, with a lot of expectation. However, I'm not quite sure how high my expectations really are. I mean, this is a very unique situation. Is he the starter? I don't think he's the starter, at least out of the gate. It would take some, you know, nothing short of an absolutely phenomenal camp for Ewers to start the season as the number one. He's coming in late. He's well behind the other three as far as his reps and his knowledge of the playbook. However, if QB1, and I think we are both assuming at this time that that's probably going to be C.J. Stroud, struggles, and if he can manage to climb that depth chart a little, he may be in the mix later in the season. He'll definitely get in to see some mop-up duty. I don't see him being any worse than third on the depth chart to start, which means, honestly, I think one of our others leave. Um, I think if Stroud starts the season and does well this season, but does not win a national championship, you should, you could see Ewers compete for the number one next season. However, I guess my question is, what happens if Stroud leads the team to the national title? Well, I'm going to answer that for you. Yeah. yeah. So, so let me start with my expectations for what we'll see from Quinn Ewers this year. Are you ready? Yes. A big, fat goose egg. I got none. Zero. It's not that I am not excited about that. It's not that I'm going to cheer for the guy. It's the fact that I I have I don't have any expectations for him. I and I I'll be honest, I don't think the coaching staff does. They these guys are set on the room that we had in Jack Miller, Kyle McCord, and CJ Stroud. And Did he all red the, shirts this year? I think he red shirts this year. I really do. And now I'm going to answer your question. How will this affect the quarterback room? We're going to lose two of these guys after this year. and I, But we, I think we're going to lose two of them anyways, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think we lose one by the end of camp. I think we lose a second by the end of the season. If, if we lose one by the end of camp, then the red shirt on Quinn Ewers might not happen. Right. And and I know some might say, why would you redshirt him? He's only going to go pro in three years anyways. It, you're right. But he could still play in four games and still get a red shirt, guys. Okay. Yes. So I'm not – what I'm saying is I don't expect him to play so much significant time that he's not eligible to get that red shirt. He's going to get in a game. He's not going to come here to Ohio State and sit on the bench the entire season. Ryan Day's not uh, – Ryan Day knows how to play the game within the game, guys. So that that's not going to happen. But what I'm saying is I think Ryan Day's also going to play Jack Miller if he sticks around. I, th- I know he's going to play Kyle McCord. And because he's got to get a backup ready. And of course, I think he's going to give CJ Stroud the first crack at this thing here. So what are my expectations? Zero. I don't have any, but that's okay. Now, how will this affect the quarterback room? I'm going to answer your question. I think you're dead on, Chris. If we don't win a national championship this year, I think there is a very good possibility Quinn Ewers is your starting quarterback next year. However, if CJ Stroud goes out there, and we win a national championship this year with one more year of eligibility, Quinn Ewers will transfer. Yeah, yeah, that, that's kind of the way I figured it as well. So and, here, here's the next thing. That really puts pricey. This is why I feel that Ewers coming in early could be a good thing, but it also might really be a detriment long term because now I think if that happens, you've got to make a push for a quarterback 
definitely in 2023 and maybe even in 2022. Both, yes. They will have to pay. They, I think Do you Brian think they Day, go after Penn State recruit Drew Auer out of Medina? Yes. Yeah, I think I think they I think the conversation's already been had, Chris. I think that telephone con- call has already been made. The question is, does Drew want to open up that conversation, or is he like saying, "Look, if I'm going to Ohio State, I'm just going to be a backup. I don't want to do that because I can go to Penn State and I can be the starter there." Well, this could change if one significant thing happens. If Kyle McCord ends up transferring and going to Penn State, he's from Pennsylvania. If he were to end up going to Penn State, then that flip could happen because Kyle McCord is not going to go there and sit the bench. That would be the best quarterback Penn State has had in a very, very long time. That's so probably what, like Kerry Collins or something? Probably Kerry Collins, yeah. Um, so – you, let's just face the fact there's a lot of moving pieces here, man. A lot of things could happen. I say we just let it play out and see how it goes, but I'm glad we've got a, more bullets in the chamber, if that makes sense. It does. But now here's my question. Should McCord travel or transfer to Penn State, does that have an impact on Marvin Harrison Jr.? No. No? It will not. And I'll tell you why, because I think Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to have such a big year this year that he's going to be a number one receiver next year for us. Fair enough. I think, I think, I mean, obviously, I think we lose two wide receivers this year. Chris Olave is going to go pro. Garrett Wilson is going to go pro. They're both going to be first round draft picks. Oh, absolutely. And so you got two starting wide receiver positions right there. We already got Jackson Smith and Jigba, who's going to be the third receiver this year. He's He'll come back for his third year next year. And then I think Marvin Harrison slips in there as the other starter. And then you've got two guys fighting and I, I and for that one other starting position in Julian Fleming and, and Emeka Egbuka. But here's the thing. Don't sleep on Ballard. Uh, he's been yeah. making some waves as well in camp. I've heard a lot of good about him. Yes, our wide receiver uh, – room took some hits with some guys who uh, transferred and Jamison Williams uh, to Alabama and then some guys who decided to end their careers uh, because they just weren't getting the playing time. But I think Jared, Jaden Ballard has got a shot to actually get on the field, make some playing time and really work towards possibly being in that rotation next year as a sophomore and then starting his junior year. I think that's a very real possibility. Six deep, so. Yeah, and they they used to run. I mean, it was zone six. They used to yep. run them constantly, and they would they would rotate them. But when Ryan Day kind of took over, Chris Olave kind of stopped that from happening because he was so good you couldn't take him off the field. And last year, Wilson and Olave both didn't rotate very much. They were on the field seventy five to eighty percent of the offensive snaps. I don't think – they're so good you just can't take them off the field, Chris. Yeah, yeah, no, I get that. So I don't know that the whole zone six, rotating six uh, evenly thing is going to happen this year, but it, we might get back to it is what I'm saying. Yeah. Anything else from camp that you feel we need to touch on, man, before we dive into our two-a-days here? No, I think uh, we're ready to move on, Eric. All right, let's take that quick commercial break. We come back. Chris is going to tell us all about the Iowa Hawkeyes, and I'm going to tell, talk to you about Rutgers. If you're not satisfied with pickup games and unranked matches, chances are you're aiming higher than most. At Spire, you'll train to be the best. Whether you're drawn to the pool, track, mat, basketball court, or gaming controller, we provide the training you need to achieve your dream. Make our facilities your home or take advantage of free transportation services. Are you ready to unlock your potential? Visit SpireCleveland.com today. That's Spire, S-P-I-R-E, Cleveland.com. And we are back, Chris. Let's continue our two-a-days, and we're going to head out west to my least favorite state in the Big Ten that's not called Michigan, that would be one Iowa. How about them Hawkeyes? I'll tell you what, Eric, the Hawkeyes are looking pretty good this season. The University of Iowa began playing in 1889. 
They play their home games in one of the toughest venues in the Big Ten Conference, that being Kinnick Stadium in Iowa City. The team has an all-time record of 636, 534, and 34, which is an all-time winning percentage of 544. Iowa is 17, 15, and 1, all-time in 33 bowl appearances for a winning percentage of 530. The Hawkeyes have an all-time record of 15, 46, and 3 against the Buckeyes but do have the last win in this series, as we all remember that 55-24 to 24 pummeling back in 2017 in Iowa City. Iowa boasts 12 conference championships in their history. The first is a member of the Western Interstate University Football Association in 1896, and they have 11 Big Ten titles to their credit. Their last conference title came in 2004. Iowa also has... Five national titles coming in 1921, 1922, 1956, 1958, and 1960. I was one of them schools, Eric. They really loved their head coaches. In fact, they've only had two over the last 42 years. Yeah. Hayden Fry was there from 1979 to 1998. And current coach, Kirk Ferentz, has been there since 1999. Ferentz is the longest tenured head coach in Iowa football history, starting his 23rd season. He spent his entire head coaching career at the University of Iowa and has an all-time record of 168-106, and 106, which is a winning percentage of 613. He is 9-8 and eight in 17 bowl appearances for a winning percentage of 529. In his 22 completed season, Ferentz has had a winning record in 17 of them, he went 500 one time and has only had four season, losing seasons in his head coaching career. He also led the Hawkeyes to their last two conference co-championships in 2002 and 2004. Kirk Ferentz does have an all-time record of 2-8 and eight against Ohio State. The Iowa Hawkeyes lost four players to the 2021 NFL Draft. Defensive end Chauncey Goldston was drafted in the third round with the 84th pick by the Dallas Cowboys. Wide receiver Emir Smith-Marset went in the fifth round, number 157 to the Minnesota Vikings. Defensive tackle Davion Nixon was chosen in the fifth round by Urban Myers and the Carolina Panthers with pick number 158. And finally, linebacker Nick Neiman joined the L.A. Chargers after being drafted in the sixth round with the 185th pick. They also lost eight players who were undrafted free agents to NFL teams. Wide receiver Brandon Smith was picked up by the Cowboys. Running back Makai Sargent and offensive guard Cole Van Wert joined the Tennessee Titans. And offensive tackle Coy Cronk and defensive tackle Jack Heflin signed with the Green Bay Packers. Tight end Sean Bear went to the Baltimore Ravens. And perhaps what's the most surprising of the undrafted players was four-year starting left tackle Alaric Jackson. Jackson ended up signing with the L.A. Rams. Kicker Keith Keith Duncan was also a big loss to their special teams unit, and while he wasn't drafted and has yet to sign with anyone, it is reported several uh, NFL teams have garnered uh, or have shown some interest in signing him. I lost two players to the transfer portal since the end of last season that being three-star safety Julius Brent, who went to Kansas State, and three-star offensive guard Noah Fenske, who transferred to Colorado. Iowa does have three other players currently active in the portal who have not yet chose a transfer destination. Defensive end Jake Karchinski, running back Keontae Luckett, and edge rusher Matt Lorbeck are all in the portal and still exploring their options. However, it is feasible they could make a return. The only player Iowa is receiving from the portal is three-star safety Xavier Williams, who is transferring in from Northern Iowa. So with the limited incoming transfers, Iowa clearly has to restock through recruiting. Iowa had the 24th-ranked recruiting class in the nation in the 2021 cycle. They ranked seventh in the Big Ten and had an average rating of .8777. The Iowa class boasts seven four-star prospects and 12 three-star prospects. The class is led by four-star offensive tackle David David Goff, 
from Winnetka, Illinois. David's a 6'6", 295-pound tackle. He was ranked 152 nationally, 17th among offensive tackles, and first out of the state of Illinois. Connor Colby is a four-star interior offensive lineman from JFK High School in Cedar Cedar Rapids, Iowa. He's 6'5", 305 pounds. He ranked 228th nationally, 17th among interior offensive linemen, and fourth out of the state of Iowa. Justin Sullivan is 6'1", 220-pound, four-star edge rusher. Around that, it's 220. Now seem a little bit light for that edge rusher position. Slightly. Yeah, but he's a he's a four-star edge rusher out of Eden Prairie High School in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. Fun fact, Eric. That is also the high school which produced WWE Hall of Famer Jane. Sergeant Slaughter. Oh, I thought you were going to go Lord Nitus. No. Sergeant Slaughter, huh? Yeah. Sullivan was rated 301st nationally, 21st among edge rushers, and second out of the state of Minnesota. Arlen Bryce is a 5'10", 195-pound, four-star athlete out of Ankeny High School in Ankeny, Iowa. Bruce is ranked 330, I'm sorry, 331st nationally, 20th among athletes, and fifth out of the state of Iowa. Arlen comes from a football family. His father played for the Chiefs and 49ers as well as in the CFL. And his father's cousin is NFL Hall of Famer Isaac Bruce, wide receiver from the Rams. Four-star offensive tackle Bo Stevens comes to the Hawkeyes from Blue Springs High School in Blue Springs, Missouri. He's 6'6", 295, was ranked 355th nationally, 26th among offensive tackles, and fourth out of the state of Missouri. Keegan Johnson is a four-star, six-foot-one, 180-pound athlete from Bellevue, Nebraska, who projects as a wide receiver. Johnson's 358th nationally, he's 22nd among among athletes, and third from the state of Nebraska. Iowa's final four-star prospect is Cooper DeJean, a six, 295-pound safety from Battle Creek High School in Ida Grove, Iowa. Cooper ranked 361st nationally, 26th among safeties, and number six out of the state of Iowa. And as I said, these guys are joined by 12 three-star recruits, including defensive lineman Max Llewellyn, interior offensive lineman Greg Dunker, or I'm sorry, Jennings Dunker, linebacker Joey Har- or Jaden Harrell, quarterback Joey Labus from Broadview Heights, Ohio, defensive lineman Griffin Liddell, Defensive lineman Jeremy Pittman. Defensive lineman Jeffrey Bow. Wide receiver Brody Breck. Athlete Zach Tweet. Inferior, interior offensive lineman Michael Mislinski. And athlete Carson Scharer. And Davion Hilson. So, Eric, I will return 13 starters from the 2020 team. They returned six on offense, seven on defense. Uh, quarterback Spencer Petrus, uh, Petrus? Petrus, yep. Petrus, yeah, who is 6'5 and 231 and comes off of a 2020 season where he completed 140 of 245 attempts for 1,569 yards with nine touchdowns and five interceptions is back. He is joined by probably the biggest key piece to their offense, and that's going to be running back Tyler Goodson. Mm-hmm. Goodson's going to determine just how successful this Iowa team is. He's a workhorse and coming off a 2020 season that saw him carry the ball 143 times for 762 yards. That's a 5.3 yard per carry average, seven touchdowns. Did this as a sophomore. He added 15 catches for 152 yards and had an average of 10.1 yards per catch. Junior tight end Sam Laporta is a primarily a blocker, but you know, he does provide some receiving production and actually was last season's leading receiver by catch number with 27 catches. He had 271 yards, which is an average of 10 per catch. Also returning on the offense, our lead blocker, Monte, I love this name, Potbaum. <laughs> he returns to clear the way for Goodson and guards Guard Cody Entz and center Tyler Linderbaum return to anchor the interior of the line. Defensively, the Hawkeyes return seven players, as I said. Defensive end Zach Van Valkenburg returns. 
He had 36 tackles and a forced fumble in eight games last season. Hybrid uh, linebacker safety, Dane Belton returns as well. He had 66 tackles, three and a half for loss, a sack, three passes defense, and a forced fumble in 2020. Middle linebacker Shane Benson, he recorded 58 tackles, three tackles for loss, and a pair of sacks last season as a sophomore. The strength of the defense, though, Eric, is going to be that secondary because it returns all of its starters. Fifth-year senior Matt Hankins had 41 tackles and an interception as well as 16 passes defensed and a fumble recovery coming from the cornerback position. The other corner is managed by senior Riley Moss. Moss had 43 tackles as a junior. He also had two interceptions, one of which he took to the house, and he had four additional passes defensed. Free safety Jack Coner had 45 tackles in eight games last season. He had a career-high three interceptions and a pair of passes defensed. And junior strong safety Kavion Merriweather had 28 tackles, two passes defensed in seven games last season. So, Eric, offensively, the Hawkeyes have a game manager at quarterback who can make some quality throws. They have a phenomenal running back in Goodson who could be among the best in the conference this season. I will lost a lot of production at receiver, but do have two receivers coming back in Nico Regini and Tyson Tracy, who both had 14 or more catches and 150 or more yards last season in backup roles. And they also returned Sam Laporta at tight end, as I said, who led the team with a total of 27 catches. Not a deep threat, but a reliable short yardage receiver. Going to get you that third down. This is going to be a typical grinded out offense uh, by Iowa, fueled by a strong run game. Defensively, Van Valkenburg, he was a third team Big Ten all uh, all Big Ten last season, and he can be disruptive. They returned two linebackers and the entire secondary from a defense that finished second in scoring defense, second in total defense, third against the run, and fifth against the pass in the Big Ten conference last season. They're experienced, they're stingy, and they're going to give a lot of teams in this conference difficulty. And on a side note, are my personal pick to win the West this season. Ooh. So Eric, oh, yes. Eric, Ooh. let's make some predictions, shall we? Ooh. Let's do this. You just shocked me. Okay, let's do this. I'm excited All to see right. how you're going to pull this out, man. So we're going to start out September 4th. Talked about this game a little bit last week. It's the Indiana Hoosiers coming to Iowa City. Tough defense versus explosive offense. Eric, I went with the Hoosiers in this one. You and Aaron and myself, we all think Indiana wins this game. I think it's close, but I think Indiana wins it. So, coming to town, or, uh, going to Iowa State, or Jack Tice yep. Stadium. Ames, Iowa. Yep. Yep. And Ames, Iowa to play Iowa State September 11th. Eric, I got Iowa winning on the road against a very good Iowa State team. Chris, yes. Aaron and I both agree the Cyclones of Iowa State will win that game. Okay. I, I think got, you're wrong. But I okay. think Aaron and I both think Iowa is going to start off 0 and 2. So then, on September 18th, we have the Kent State Golden Flashes. They're coming to Iowa City. I'm going to go Iowa, Eric. Oh, uh, that's going to – that'd be three of us. We all think that's a win. All right. The following weekend, September 25th, again in Iowa City, it's the Colorado State Rams. Give me Iowa. I agree, and so does Aaron. All right. On October the 1st. Iowa travels to Maryland. Eric, give me Iowa at Maryland. Again, Aaron and I both agree with you. That's a win for the Hawkeyes. Okay. Here we go. I think we may part ways here, Eric. I think so. The Penn State Nittany Lions come to Kinnick Stadium on October 9th. I'm taking Iowa for the upset. Okay. <clears throat> I... I struggled with this one because I think this might be a 
seven o'clock kick under the lights at Kinnick Stadium. And when that happens, bad things happen to the teams from the East. Michigan's lost there like that. Ohio State's lost there like that. Penn State definitely can lose there like that. But I just feel like there's this this is one of those games where Iowa maybe should win, but they won't. And uh, to me, it's coaching. They just never are are the they just can't pull it out when it really matters. And so I think Iowa will lose this game to Penn State, and I'm not the only one. Aaron agreed with me. Well, that's okay. At least you can be wrong together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then on October 16, Purdue comes to town, and that is an Iowa victory. Yes, I agree, and so does Aaron. Okay, here we go. Iowa travels to Camp Randall. Mm-hmm. You're going to do it, aren't you? I'm going to do it, Eric. Wow. I'm taking Iowa in the upset on the road. No way. PM game. No way. Uh-uh. Aaron, Aaron said Wisconsin. I think if this game was in Iowa, you got a shot. But in Camp Randall, no, that's that's Wisconsin all the way. Okay. I'm telling you, I think they're going to ride that defense. Okay, so here we go. They're then going to go to another tough place to play, and that is Ryan Field in Evanston, Illinois, on November the 6th. Eric, I'm still going with Iowa. Yeah, actually, Aaron and I agreed with you. That's a win. Uh, Northwestern's going to take a slight step back this year, so I think Iowa uh, pulls that victory out, and Aaron agreed with me. Okay. So then on November the 13th, the Gophers come to town. Yes, Eric, I am taking Iowa again. Yeah, I'm with you on this one. And I'll tell you, it's at home. If this game would have been in Minnesota, I probably would have gone ahead and gone with the Gophers. But the fact that this one is at, at home at Kinnick Stadium, again, I just feel that, that I think home field advantage is really going to play a part in the West this year. And so I'm going to go with Iowa and Aaron did as well. All three of us. I uh, think it's a sweep over the Golden Gophers. Okay, so on November 20th, they're playing my other darlings from the West this year, the Fighting Illini. Eric, I got to go with Iowa. Yeah, Iowa's too strong here. So I'll give, give three W's from all of us to Iowa against Illinois. And then their final game of the season before the Big Ten Championship game is going to be at Nebraska. Eric, I'm taking Iowa in a game where I don't believe Scott Frost will still be the head coach. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't even know that Scott Frost will be here then. So uh, Iowa with the W, all three of us agree with you. So, uh, wow, you went Iowa with an 11-1 and season, dude. I did. Wow. So so Vegas has got them at eight and a half. So you got to pick that over under Vegas. Vegas thinks this is a little bit of a trap. A lot of people can find eight wins, but can they find that ninth? That's why they're giving them that eight and a half there to try to sucker you in to take the over. Uh, you've got them way over the uh, over that uh, eight and a half mark at eleven wins. Aaron's got them at eight and four, just under that eight and a half, and I do as well. Aaron and I actually agreed on every single one of the games for their schedule. I got them at eight and four, just under that eight and a half. And you say, take the over. These are interesting betting odds here. So that eight and a half is tricky. You can't do a push, obviously, with a half game. So you, it's either eight or nine, and they're going to make money off of you here. And I'm afraid they're going to make money off you, Chris. I don't think so, Eric. I think <laughs> you're going to be making money off us, huh? <laughs> I think the worst they go is 10 and two. Wow. And that, would be, that would be with a loss to either. Penn State or Wisconsin or Wisconsin. I'm telling you, the but beginning I don't the, think they lose them both. The beginning of the season is very tricky for them with Indiana and Iowa State back to back. Iowa State is a huge rival. Actually, you know, I, Iowa claims that Nebraska is the rival. That's kind of their 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 claim there. But it's so friendly of a rivalry. It's nowhere near as, as bitter in that state as Iowa State is. Um, and I know about it because my, my son and my daughter live there with my ex-wife. And I'm telling you, dude, that state is split down the middle when it comes to Iowa and Iowa State. And it is bitter. 
that game is actually a huge deal in that state. And in, in Iowa State, the one thing that they've not been able to do with Campbell as their coach is beat Iowa. I think it's happening this year. And that could I'll tell you, they're great. Bad they're loaded. Iowa. They are. They've got everybody they, back. They are loaded. But I just think that this is a, a special kind of year for Iowa, at least up until they get to the Big Ten title game. I think it's going to be a special year for one team in that state. I agree. I just don't think it's going to be the Hawkeyes. Okay, so Eric, why don't you tell us a little bit about Rutgers? How about a real exciting team like Rutgers? <laughs> well, Chris, I don't know if you knew this or not, but nobody has played college football longer than Rutgers University. I did know that. The first college football game ever was against Rutgers against New Jersey. I don't even know who New Jersey is, but they played it back in all the way back in 1869 on November 6th. That is the birthplace of college football in Piscataway, New Jersey, believe it or not. Rutgers plays in High Point Solutions Stadium there in Piscataway. It holds 52,454 screaming fans. The record last year for uh, Rutgers was a improving 3-6 and six under the uh, leadership of one Greg Schiano, who was making his second stint as head coach for um, the Rutgers Scarlet Knights. Uh, their most successful years by far were under Shiano back when he was head coach for them in now the defunct Big East Conference before they joined the Big Ten. Rutgers has been playing football so long, they have 653 wins to 663 losses to go along with 42 ties for a winning percentage of Point four nine six. They do have a winning record in bowl games, Chris. Believe it or not, Rutgers is six and four in bowl games. So that's actually better than a lot of Big Ten teams. When that's they a get, fun fact. Yeah, when they get there, they do well. So give them credit for that. Uh, Shiano as head coach uh, for Rutgers is 71 and 73. He did have a winning record until last year where he lost six and won three. But again, give him time. He did this before in the Big East. We'll see if he can do it now in the Big Ten. Rutgers all-time against Ohio State, Chris, 0-7. They have never beaten the Buckeyes. In fact, through the years 2016 through 2018, they never even scored one touchdown against us for three consecutive games. That streak came to an end in 2019, and then Chris, Ash, uh, that was right after Chris Ash was released of his duties midseason. They did come in and get a, a score against us, a couple scores, and then last year's game of 49 to 27 was the closest score ever between Rutgers and Ohio State. Rutgers uh, did lose some guys, although they weren't drafted to the NFL. They did lose a couple. Uh, defensive tackle Wilmington Pre Prevelian. He went undrafted but signed with the uh, Packers. And offensive lineman Camille Seymour went undrafted but signed with the Raiders. The transfer portal was not kind to the roster as far as a lot of guys who left, including four-star senior defensive tackle Malik Barrow, who ended up going to Alabama A&M. That's a name that should sound familiar to us Buckeye fans. Three-star senior quarterback Arthur Sikowski, who was the backup last year, has uh, started a uh, uh, here sporadically here and there in his career in Rutgers is now the backup over in Illinois, as we talked about last week uh, on our two a days. Three star senior defensive end El, El, Elorm Lumore is going to Towson to make sure that he's going to make sure he gets the play now, apparently. Three star senior wide receiver Everett Warmly is going to Central Connecticut State. Same thing, never got to play, go to a small school. Make sure you get on the field. Three-star sophomore running back K. Ron Adams has transferred to UMass. Three-star sophomore defensive end Matthew Thomas to Rhode Island. Three-star sophomore wide receiver Stanley King to Northwestern State. Three-star freshman wide receiver Braden Fox is transferring to Toledo. Three-star senior wide receiver Tyler uh, Hayek is undecided, so we'll see if he can, makes his way back to the team. Along with three-star junior defensive end to Tawan Mason, three-star sophomore quarterback Donald Williams, and three-star sophomore wide receiver Paul Woods. 
all of them undecided currently. Incoming freshmen for Rutgers, they had the ninth best recruiting class in the Big Ten. That's right. They were better than five other teams in the Big Ten. They got four-star four star cornerback Elijah Clark from Camden, New Jersey. He's 6'2", 180 pounds, was the 276th national and 22nd at his position, fifth in the state of New Jersey. And they also received four-star linebacker Kyrie, Kyrie, sorry, Kyrie Banton from Newark, New Jersey, 6'2", 220 pounds, 281st nationally, 32nd at his position of linebacker and sixth in the, and sixth in the state of New Jersey. Chris, you want to find out how good things are getting for Rutgers in the recruiting department? Go check out how they're doing in the 2022 class. They currently have a top 10 recruiting class in the nation. No you know, joke. that doesn't surprise me with Shiano being back there. Yep. And what's going to do it is he keeps those those Jersey boys, those yep. tri-state area boys at home. That's it. You know, there's a lot of talent in that area, and he knows he might not be able to grab the top guy every single time, but if he's getting the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth best guy every single year consistently, New Jersey, uh, I'm sorry, Rutgers, they should be New Jersey University or New Jersey State, let's just be honest. That would be make much more sense than Rutgers, in my opinion, but they will they will start to not only compete they will start to win significant games and i'm serious about this in 2 years if the recruiting continues to improve at rutgers like it is and michigan does not get their head screwed on straight rutgers will be better than michigan in 2 years we might even see it this year possibly i kid you yeah. not it's all possible. right all right Let's talk about some incoming transfers. I'd say they lost a lot, but I think Greg Schiano was very he's he has he has used that transfer portal to his advantage. He had some guys yes. last year that he did a, a good job in and in, in getting in to, to kind of right the ship there and and stabilize the program. Now he's getting guys who actually started at other schools who are going to make who are going to make waves for his team this year. So let's take a look at some of them. You got Patrice Rene, a three-star senior cornerback from North Carolina, who um, is going to be a starter this year. They 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 said he will start this year. You got three-star uh, offensive tackle David, and bear with me. This is a quite the name. Nuegu Wu. Nuegu Wu. I think. <laughs> Nuegu Wu. Big Dave. We'll just call him Big Dave. Big Dave. That sounds. Thank you. He's coming from Temple. He's a right tackle, and he's going to be starting there for this year for, for Rutgers, and he'll have two years to play for him. Now you got a senior defensive tackle, also from Temple, in Ifiani Meji, maybe. I, I I'm trying my best. Iggy. I am. If if Ianni Maji maybe <laughs> I think okay. Um, started last year for Temple. Both him and David both started for Temple, and they are going to be playing this year. And then they got a good wide receiver that's going to be on their two deep and three star uh, Kansas State transfer Josh Youngblood. So he's got some time to develop as well, but he's good enough and talented enough to get on the field this year. He probably won't start, but he will get on the field. About starters, they are returning on defense seven starters, and on offense, they are returning one, two, three, four, five, nine. This is a very experienced football team, Chris. And that's to go with the guys who transferred in who will start, who were starters last year on the schools that they went to. There is a lot of experience on this Rutgers team, finally. And check this out. Let's start with the offense. Senior quarterback Noah Vidral. He was 136 of, of 221 last year uh, for 1,253 yards, nine touchdowns and eight interceptions. Um, and he did suffer an injury last year, but he's 100% healthy and ready to go. Here is someone, here's a name you need to know if you don't know it already. Running back Isaiah P Pacheco. Mm -hmm. Dude can, dude can ball. He is a tough load. 
Ohio State, you should remember him last year, fans. He had a decent game against us. 116 yards, or excuse me, 116 carries, 515 yards last year, three touchdowns. He is going to be a load. Wide re- senior wide receiver Bo Melton kind of broke out last year in his junior year. 47 catches for 638 yards, six touchdowns. They are expecting him to lead this team in uh, in that category of receptions and yards. Junior wide receiver Aaron Cruikshank returns. And senior um, wide receiver Shamin Jones, who had 34 catches last year, is also back, along with senior tight end Giovanni Haskins. Now let's talk about this offensive line. Junior left tackle Raekwon O'Neal is back. Junior left guard Cedric um, Paliant is back, or Paylant maybe, is back. You got the right tackle, like I mentioned, to go along with the freshman, redshirt freshman center uh, Brian Felter, who started last year and has uh, got the red shirt because of number of games played. So he's going to be back. He ended the year as a starter, coming back uh, this year as well. And then junior right guard Reggie Sutton is going to be back as well. This is an experienced, big offensive line. Again, this is a team. I'm telling you, Chris Rutgers, they are not going to get blown out this year by anybody. If, if anybody blows them out, it'll be Ohio State. But as we saw last year, they're hard to blow out. This is a solid football team now. And now look at their defense. Defensive end Mike uh, Tverdov is back. He had 10 and a half tackles for loss last year. And uh, to go along with the other defensive end, CJ Oniek or Oneki, who had 26 tackles last year. And then defensive tackle Julius Turner returns as well. And don't forget, I also said Temple's uh, defensive tackle. Ifiani Meja or Meji <laughs> will be joining that group up front as well. The linebacking position, there is one name on here that ju- should jump out at you. Uh, he had a heck of a game last year against Ohio State. Tyson Fogg, I don't know if you remember him. Mm-hmm. 70 tackles last year to lead the way. He is back and ready to rumble. You got, uh, and then their defensive backfield is really good as well. Senior quarterback Trey Avery. Uh, was third team all Big Ten last year. He returns. Junior safety Avery Young is moving from cornerback to safety to go along with Christian Isian, who had four interceptions last year in a shortened year at the safety position. Um, this was the, the defense is, needs to improve, but and so does the offense. But here's the thing: their entire coaching staff is back for the first time in Rutgers in probably a decade. Okay, so just the stability of the coaching staff alone, along with all of the upperclassmen you've got here starting is going to make, I think, for an exciting year for the Rutgers uh, fans. And I think this is a team that might scare some people. So let's get into our predictions, Chris, and find out what you thought of them, Um, because Aaron and I kind of both are on the same page with Rutgers again. They're going to beat some people, and there are some games that gave me pause. So here we go. Let's do it. They start the season at home against Temple, the very team they seem to raid. They uh, they're going to play against to start the season off. <laughs> Aaron's got them winning. I've got them with them winning. What do you say, Chris? Oh yeah, Rutgers has that one. First game on the road in week number two at Syracuse. Syracuse was one and ten last year. Aaron and I both have Rutgers winning that football game. As do I. All right. Back home to play a smaller school in Delaware. Again, Aaron and I both say W. Yep. I've got Rutgers beating Delaware. All right. Here we go. This is where the fun starts. Rutgers is 3-0 to start the season off in in, in what I think is a very winnable non-conference. Here we go. At... Michigan. I'm I paused. I paused seriously long here. I wanted to do it. I just in my heart of hearts I couldn't pull it out. And so I went with a uh I went with a loss here. And and I I even looked over at Aaron to see if Aaron had the guts to do it. He didn't. So we both have him losing the Michigan. What do you think? Do you think they can win this one? Eric, if this was in Pescataway. I take Rutgers. Okay. In the big house, I'm going to take Michigan. Okay. Yeah, it came down to that as to me as well. Then they're uh, then they travel or they're at home. Then they host Ohio State after playing Michigan. I think this is an auto L. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, Aaron agrees as well. I do want to make one correction. Actually, Aaron has them losing to Temple at the beginning of the year. Oh. I, I I misspoke there. So yeah, he has them losing to Temple. Everything else has been correct though. All right, verse Michigan State now. Uh, Aaron says loss for Rutgers, win for Michigan State. I said win for Rutgers, loss for Michigan State. So I think Rutgers at home beats Michigan State. What do you think? You're the tiebreaker here, Chris. Eric, this is a win for Rutgers. I agree. Michigan State just doesn't have – they are further behind in their rebuild than what Rutgers is. And plus, I think when 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 – when Shiano took over Rutgers, even though we made fun of Rutgers and they were the doormat of the Big Ten, I think Ash may have left him a little bit more talent than what uh, Michigan State had over there. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Uh, Rutgers gets a bye, and then they uh, – or excuse me. Nope. Before their bye, they travel to Northwestern. Uh, I have uh, Rutgers losing this game to Northwestern. And Aaron does as well. But I think, Chris, you might have an upset here. I do. I have Rutgers winning the game in uh, Evanston. You just found that fifth win for Rutgers. They have, they had their over under is four games. You got them at five right now. Now the bye week and then Illinois at Illinois. Uh, let's see here. Aaron says this is going to be a win for Rutgers. I have this going to be a loss. I think Illinois gets the win here. I think you agree with me, if I'm not mistaken. That's correct. I took Illinois in this one as well. All right. Then they host Wisconsin. This is an auto L from Aaron uh, as well for me. I think the Badgers win this one easy. What do you think? I agree. All right. Chris agrees, and he goes with the loss to Wisconsin. All right. They're at Indiana, I have a loss. I think Indiana wins. Aaron agrees with me. Are you on the same page as us? I am. All right. So Indiana gets the win there at Penn State. Um, again, I got I gave pause. I went ahead and went with Penn State. If this game was in Piscataway, it might be a little different, but I'm going to go win for Penn State over Rutgers. Aaron agrees with me as well. Chris, what say you? That's unanimous. Okay. Then the last one, this is for bowl eligibility here for Rutgers, man. Uh, for you, anyways. Uh, versus Maryland. Aaron says win for the Terps. I actually have a win for Rutgers over Maryland to give them five for me. Chris, can you get that six win here? Greg Schiano is going bowling. Wow. Okay, so we've got quite the despair here between us. Aaron's got Rutgers at three and nine. I've got Rutgers at five and I guess that would make it seven. And you got them at six and six. You and I both agree. Take the over on Rutgers. Aaron says take the under. So we got some difference of opinions here. I like that. That's what makes this fun. I just think I think the, the the fact that they got so much leadership um, as far as upperclassmen and what I I think the culture there under Shiano is just better, and I think was I think Rutgers is going to be in some games that a lot of people think they have no chance to win, and I think they've got a shot to win, and you agree with me, so there you have it. I'll tell you what, and there's a few teams that, like you said, better not sleep on them, and one of them is uh, that team up north. I agree. People on Rutgers, they could get surprised. They could get the, they could get upset. I agree with you. I mean, I had some serious pause there. So, all right, guys, there you have it. <clears throat> There's our two a days for this week. We will be back next week again to continue with the two a days. Next week will be Michigan State and Wisconsin, and and then we jump into uh, one of the, the, my more favorite shows of the year when we do Penn State and Michigan together. That's just a blast. So really looking forward to that. So um, we're going to take our last commercial break. We come back. We are going to play another game this week. We're going to play true and false, true or false. This is going to be a lot of fun. So hang tight, everybody. 
The OHIO Podcast is brought to you by Mastermind. Mastermind specializes in 360-degree high-definition mobile video mapping, GIS integration, and traffic safety studies. Mastermind cares about traffic safety and keeping you safe on the roadway. Visit Mastermind at OnlineMastermind.com. And welcome back to the OHIO podcast. All right, Chris, here we go. We're going to play a little true or false. I'm going to make a statement, and then you're going to say, is that statement going to be true or false this season and why? We do have one fan submission this week that we're going to give. And, of course, we'll just pepper each other as well with these. So here we go. Are you ready? Absolutely. All right. I gave you this example in the show notes, so you've had some time to probably prepare for this one. The rest of them will be completely blind. You'll have no idea. So here's the first one. There will be eight Big Ten teams who go to bowl games this season. True or false? Ooh, I'm going to go true. And okay. I'll tell you why. I think the the last one that gets in is that Rutgers team. All right. Let's, let's, let's count them out. You ready? Mm-hmm. You just say in or out. Ohio State. Okay. Is in. Michigan. Is in. Michigan State. No. Penn State. Yes. Maryland. Right now, I think you have them six I and think, six. Yeah, I think it's a yes. Indiana. Yes. Rutgers. Yes. So from the east, that's one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. All, all you got to do is find two more. I think you got it. Nebraska? That's a no. No. Wisconsin? Yes. Minnesota? Ooh, there's pause. Yes. Let's come, I, let's come, let's come back to them. Iowa? Come back to them. Yes. Purdue? No. Northwestern? No. I think you got them as a yes, don't oh, you? Oh, no. No, I do have them as a yes. Yeah, you Sorry. do. Yes, and, there's my... In Illinois, you do too. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would say Wisconsin or Minnesota might be a no for you at this point. Minnesota for me is a no. Okay, so you got one, two, three, four from the west to go along with Five six six east. from the east. You got ten, so you found eight and plus plus two. Good on you, man. All right, your turn. Give me a true or false. Okay, Eric. The Buckeyes will have 2,000-yard receivers this year. True. Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson. I believe it. I believe it. They're going to play enough. They're both going to get their get their number. Uh, here's one from Scott Rogers. Let's do our fan submission here. You ready? Mm-hmm. I'll let you take this one. Will the Buckeyes have one starting quarterback for the entire season? <laughs> That's Meaning, funny. That's one of mine. Meaning, okay, great. I'll let you answer it, then I'll answer yours the same one. Meaning, the same guy's going to start all year long. Eric, I'm going to say yes. I think that C.J. Stroud is going to get in there, and he's going to do an extremely good job, and he will hold the starting position down for the whole year. I agree. True. So I'll answer yours uh, as well. I think that's, I think that's true. I, I think C.J. Stroud is the man. All right, here we go. Here's my next one for you. Three Big Ten coaches will be fired at the end of the season. No. False. I predict two. All right, you're going to go with Scott Frost? Yep. Are you going to go with Brom or Harbaugh? I'm going to go with Brom. Okay. You think Harbaugh think, hangs on? I think Harbaugh hangs on one more season. All right. My turn. Go for it. All right. True or false? The Buckeyes will not have a thousand yard rusher this season. False. I'll tell you why. My next question goes right into it. Mayan Williams will lead the team in rushing yards this season. True or false? I'm going to say true. 
Mm, I agree. But I think I do I not think, think he gets to a thousand. I okay, so you think he'll be like eight, nine hundred, and you think yes. Travion Henderson will be at like seven, six hundred, and then you have. I think you'll have three backs over five hundred yards. Ooh, okay. Well, I tell you, if that's the case, then we better two. We better two of them better be close to a thousand then, in yards. If you have three over 500, two of them better be knocking on the door of 900 each. Because if you go back and you look at what J.K. Dobbins did Mm -hmm. with the 2,000 yards season, and you go back and look what Zeke did, the best years we've had, we've had a running back that has just dominated at the end of the year and pumped out some serious yards. And and that's that's when we are at our best offensively. Well, and I'll tell you, I'm going to go on record as saying it right now. I think Mayan Williams gets between eight and nine hundred yards. I think that Travion Henderson gets between eight and nine hundred yards. I think the usage for Master Teague comes down. He's more that that uh, or five hundred. That, that that five yeah five hundred was what I was gonna say. Yard type uh, guy. I think he uh, kind of his role becomes more that what we said before that change of pace back. Mm-hmm. And maybe a little bit more in the goal line situations. Crazy scenario. He might be third in yardage, but he might lead the team in rushing touchdowns. Yes. I could see that happening. All right. Another one for you. <clears throat> Ohio State will win every game in the regular season by double figures. True or false? Conventional wisdom says to say false, but I'll tell you what. I'm excited. I'm going to say true. Ooh, I like it. I like it. Give me one, brother. All right. Steel Chambers will start a game at linebacker this season. False. Okay. I I got to see it to believe it. Let me see what he looks like first. Um, until I see it with my own eyes, I just it's just hard for me to believe. He's going to go into that. I'll say this. If he, if he starts at linebacker this year, then what in the heck were they doing with him in running back for so long? A and B, are we that bad at linebacker now? Uh-oh. Yeah. You know what I mean? All right, here's one for you. <clears throat> if Nick Saban wins another national championship this season, he will retire at the end of the season. It's kind of funny, Eric. I have that same one on my sheet. <laughs> yeah, you know... And honestly, I'm going to say no. I think he stays again. That's false. Hmm. Okay, I'll disagree since you're asking it to me. I say true. I think if he goes out back-to-back and wins this one, I think he wants to go out riding in the sunset as being the greatest college football coach of all time without a blemish on his record to end this season. I think I think that would be how he would want to do it. I mean, I would think so. But I, I, I get you. All right. Here's another coaching one for you, coaching legend one for you. Are you ready for this? I'm ready for it. Urban Meyer will return to the college game to be a head coach after failing in the NFL, a la Nick Saban. I'm going to say false. I think that Urban's going to do well in the NFL. Really? Hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. I, I got one for you, Eric. Okay. True or false, Scott Frost will be replaced by midseason. True. I don't think he makes it. I don't think he makes it to the end of the year. That that uh, Big Ten Media Day days interviews with him, he mm-hmm. looked so beat down, dude. I think he's yeah. done. I think he's mentally checked out. And if he's checked out, their and their team's checked out, the way their schedule is, I think he's doomed. They will have. They will basically have to make a midseason change to try to appease the fan base. I think. Speaking of fans, I've got one here for you that you don't want to talk about. All right. True or false? The reemergence of COVID will shut down fans at some oh. point this season. False. It's false. And I'll tell you why. Yes, there's this new COVID variant. I get it. I people are just sick and tired of the political BS with this thing. It's false. Okay. I hope. I hope anyways. <laughs> All right. Here's one for you. The Big Ten will add two additional teams, and they will be Kansas and Iowa State. Whew. 
You know what? I know, that one, I know that I, I know that uh, we're wanting to slow down expansion, but I think it's inevitable. I'm going to say true. Okay. You know, I think based off the, the the general location of those schools, the fact that I think Iowa and Iowa State are natural rivals. They're both AAU schools. I think the Pac-12 and the Big Ten will go in this thing together and say, all right, let's go both to 16. We'll take these two because they're closest to us. You take the other ones because they're closer to you. We are now a 32 conference or 32 team joint conference partnership to basically fight back against the SEC. It's funny because one of my questions was going to be the Big Ten and Pac-12 will announce a conference realignment alignment partnership. True, and I think that partnership will consist of each each team will play two uh, non-conference games against each other, one at home, one away, and they will rotate amongst those uh, 16 teams throughout the course of basically uh, what, eight, eight years, I guess it would be. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then they'll play each other essentially in their conference games. And, and basically it's our way to answer what the ESPN has done with the SEC and the ACC essentially. So Eric, true or false, Brett Bielema will have a surprising season and win big 10 coach of the year. Ooh, big 10 coach of the year. Hmm. I'm gonna go false. I'm gonna go false. I don't think. I don't think uh, going. I mean, you got him six and six. I had him going four and eight. I don't think four and eight can get you Big Ten Coach of the Year. But if they go six and six and are bowl eligible this season, does he win Coach of the Year? Given where they've come from. False. I think Penn State's Franklin will get coached the year because I think they're going to have a big bounce back year. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. You got any more for me? I do not. I don't have any more. I think I got through all of mine. Did you get through yours? I got through most of them, but I'll tell you what. Here we go. True or false? One to go out on. Georgia will finally dethrone Alabama as SEC champs this year. This year? Yes, true. I believe it. I, I'm kind of letting everybody in on what I'm picking. I, th- I think, I think Georgia's got the horses this year to do it. I've kind of okay. leaned. I've leaned on them once before. Last year I didn't, but I leaned on them once before. It didn't come through. I actually had Jake Fromm as the Heisman Trophy winner <laughs> that of his senior year. It did, obviously or junior year. It didn't. It didn't for, come to fruition at all, and they had a bad year. But I think uh, I think Georgia bounces back this year. Has a really strong year, um, and I'll tell you. I'm I'll, here. I'll kind of let you in on a secret. I'll throw this one out at you too. I'll give you another true or false. Oklahoma will not win the Big 12 this year. True or false? I think that's true. I think Iowa State wins the Big 12. Yeah. Guys, get ready for a lot of craziness in the college football playoff committee world because I I am not sure that there will be more than one or two teams that will be undefeated this year, and there will okay. be a there will be a lot of controversy in the top four. And I think Iowa State will have a lot to do with that. Can I uh, throw one more at you here that I had Let's on my it. list? Yeah. If Bama is dethroned as SEC, SEC champions, will the playoff committee still find a way to put Alabama in the playoff? True. It's con- it's contractual with the ESPN. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, they'll, they'll find a way I'm telling you, which will be why everybody will be crying for playoff expansion. It's almost like they will do it on purpose to kind of fit their narrative. Yep. So I could definitely see that, see, see that happening. All right. A couple pieces of news on our way out here. Uh, Bobby Bowden passed away today. Old Florida state head coach. Uh, he was 91 years old. Um, Bobby Bowden was a great dude, and 
I loved listening to him talk, Chris. He was yeah. one of those people that when he opened his mouth, he you just sat and listened, you know? Just one of those voices and his approach to football and his approach to life, he was one of the greats. And I hate losing one of the greats because not only does it mean I'm getting older, but it, it just signals the the – the air gone by is is a little further past us, man, and it, it kind of stinks. But uh, hate to lose Bobby Bowden, man. That was rough. Um, one good piece of news: Aaron Brown. Yes, that Aaron Brown, our co-host, our buddy, our compadre, returned late last night, early this morning, from a nine months tour of duty overseas. He's back home, and he will be back on the podcast. Maybe not next weekend, but in a couple weeks, Chris, the glass breaker himself, the coach, Aaron Brown, will be returning to the OHIO podcast, Chris. The glass breaker? Can we get him some stone cold music? Oh, that's his music, dude. Yeah, that's his man. <laughs> that's his man. He says, open up some cold ones. Throw them at me, man. He's a, <laughs> That's his dude right there. So. You know what? He, he's earned the right, you know? He has. He, Aaron Brown is one bad dude, man. He he is he is a he's a man among boys. I'll tell you, and I'm glad he's on my side, brother. I'll tell you that much. But uh, he will be back. He just got back. He obviously, he's got to get acclimated back to everything. Saw pictures of him with his wife and children. He hasn't seen his son in nine months, and the little guy's grown up so much since he left. And seeing those pictures was so heartwarming. But it is great. To have our man Aaron Brown back with us, and he will be back on the show shortly. Just give him some time to spend with his his family and his wife and children. Obviously, we want to respect that, but I know he's looking forward to jumping back on here with us and talking about the Buckeyes. So I wanted to let everybody know the good news. All right, Chris, that takes us to an end of another show. We also want to encourage everybody to check out Chris and my sh- little sideshow that we're doing called Varsity Video. We had that first episode up about Remember the Titans. Gotten a, real, a lot of really good feedback from that, Chris. A lot of people like that. Obviously, we didn't have the numbers with that as, as many as we have for our regular uh, uh, OHIO podcast shows, but that was to be expected. But, hey. We appreciate all of you who did listen. We hope you liked that, and we look forward to bringing more of those to you. And, of course, we'll always be bringing you the great Buckeye content here on the OHIO podcast uh, every week on the weekend on a Sunday. But, hey, Chris, we're going to get very close here to kicking off the season, and when that happens, we go to two shows a week, man, so it's all right around the corner. Of course, we have the big show at the Ohio State Store and lots more uh, birthday anniversary, right, on the 28th? Absolutely, the 28th. We've got uh, all kinds of exciting things planned. Of course, you and I are going to be there. What more can people want? They should come out just for us. I mean, we are a treat all in itself. You know what I'm saying? That's right. We are just, we are the gift that keeps on giving, let me tell you. (laughs) And and I'll tell you, there's going to be some great, uh, great deals going in the store. Um, The, the, you know, Vicky's arranging to feed us all. And I mean, that's saying a lot because you and I are not small guys, Eric. No, we're not. No, I was so, gonna say. I was gonna say we're 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 pretty nice eye candy, but then then I thought I'm like eh, I don't know about that. <laughs> Maybe like a Hershey's Kiss because I'm like small on the top and kind of get bigger as I go down. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. One of those circus but, peanut candies, maybe. <laughs> yeah, something like that. But yeah, I mean, there, there's going to be a lot of giveaways. Uh, there's going to be some raffles going on. Um, you know, I think we've mentioned. Uh, I know that a Maurice Claret uh, autographed jersey is going to be one of the raffle items. We have a really nice um, bronze color uh, metal sign with the block O in it. That's a great wall hanging for the house or the garage. That's going to be one of our raffle items. Just all kinds of, of, of giveaways as well. And like I said, super deals throughout the store. There's going to be 10% off any purchase of $50 or more. Uh, we're going to have food. Um, beverages, and of course, you and I are going to provide all the entertainment anybody could possibly want. <laughs> so, yeah, it should be a great time. Uh, that's going to be August 28th from 11 o'clock until 4 o'clock. And, uh, yeah, we hope to see a, hope a lot of our viewers, a lot of our listeners can make it down for that. 
yeah it'd be great we'd love to get to meet some of you so looking forward to that all right guys that is our show for this week as always be kind to one another i owe someone's oh in sing carmen ohio with all your heart and until next time oh oh go bucks oh come let's sing oh Hios praise and songs through armor rain while our hearts rebounding thrill and joy which death alone can still summer's heat oh winter's cold the seasons pass the years will roll time and change will surely show How firm thy friendship, Ohio.